hybridization between ideas, or as I like to put it, ideas having sex, is an absolutely central feature of economic progress. And it's a very biological idea when you think about it like that. My name's Matt Ridley. Uh, I write non-fiction books, mostly about uh, um, science, human nature, genetics, evolution, and particularly recently, economics. The Red Queen is uh, a character in Through the Looking Glass by Lewis Carroll. She runs very fast but never gets anywhere. She's always staying in the same place however fast she runs. And this is a metaphor that, was used, that is used in evolution to describe arms races. That, that, that argument can explain a surprising amount about human nature, that an awful lot of what we do is sexually selected in the sense of being um, like, say, male ambition, you know, uh, to succeed in life is, is all about trying to get uh, ahead in the, the Red Queen race with, with respect to mate choice. There is little doubt that, um, uh, um, that rock and roll guitar heroes uh, are considered sexy. Um, <laughs> and virtuosity, um, talent, um, high status, uh, these are things that lead to genetic success um, through being able to acquire the right kind of mates. It's very hard to, to say exactly what the sort of natural way of mating in our species is. But one thing, we, we, we can get a few clues from comparing with other animals. So it looks like we're a pair bonding species where male and females form long-term pair bonds and both help bring up the children. But like in a lot of pair bonding species, and this work comes mainly from birds, which also do this, that doesn't necessarily mean that uh, the female is going to accept that male being the only father of her children. In other words, she wants a, a, a partner who will help bring up the children, but she might want to get some better genes from another guy. Um, that's what happens in a lot of birds um, that are very similar in their social structure to human beings. It's an intriguing thought. I wouldn't particularly want to be a bonobo because females are dominant in bonobos and males uh, do what they're told. Okay. It would be quite fun to be a chimpanzee because you'd get uh, a, a, a ton of sex but there'd be an awful lot of fighting. Orangutans are very solitary. I don't think that sounds a lot of fun. Um, uh, and gibbons are a bit like humans. They live in pairs um, and bring up families together. So, yeah, the life of the silverback alpha male gorilla is probably the most um, spectacularly idle and um, uh, um, enjoyable one in that sense. But you'd have to put up with the fact that after a while you're going to get beaten up and probably killed. Um, and that when you first came into the troop, you'd have to kill a lot of babies, which doesn't, neither of those sound like things that I would enjoy. Morality comes from both our animal past and our very specifically more recent human past, in the sense that there are things we do which other animals also do and that we did when we were animals, um, like build trusting relationships with them. Um, and there are things we do now as human beings that other animals don't do that require us to be nice. And virtue equals cooperative behavior. There is a very strong pressure within uh, human society to spot and ostracize antisocial people and to reward and encourage pro-social people. The most exciting thing to come out of the Genome Project was the, re the, re the stunning realization, the, 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 the complete surprise, that there are no human genes. Well, there are a few, but that we've basically got the same genes as a mouse or a chimpanzee or a whale or a dolphin or a dog, that all mammals have the same 21,000 genes, give or take a couple of hundred. We didn't expect that. The nature-nurture debate is a is an old and tired debate that's gone on for centuries about whether we're born or made. And I think it got utterly reinvigorated and partially solved when genomes were sequenced and we began to understand how genes worked. Because what it emerged was that genes, which you think of as nature, are actually to some extent at the mercy 
of our behavior, our culture, and our environment, which we think of as nurture. And even in laying down a memory in your brain, you have to switch on a bunch of genes, 17 genes in the brain, every time you lay down a memory, in real time. It's a much more interesting than just saying um, it's a bit of both. It's saying the two interact in a dynamic way. My next project is a book uh, which I'm trying to write to understand what it is that's different about human beings from other species, focusing particularly on the role of exchange and specialization. Clearly, we're different from our immediate ancestors in that we've, we've leapt to, an, to, to, to nearly seven billion people, we've taken over the planet, we've, we've done these extraordinary things in just a few tens of thousands of years with a brain not particularly bigger than the one that we had before that. What changed? And I think it was exchange and specialization that we got into the habit of the division of labor. Uh, Darwin got his idea of spontaneous order from the political economists. I think that's pretty explicit. He was reading Adam Smith himself, he was reading Malthus, he was reading Harriet Martineau, people like this, and, and he, was, he was getting this idea of, of emergent spontaneous order from um, the, the tradition of empirical philosophers and, and, and political economists. And actually, I'm interested in seeing whether the favor can now be returned and some of the insights from evolutionary biology can illuminate uh, economics. One aspect of human nature that is absolutely central to the economic system is, is the ability to trust people. To the extent that economic systems allow people to develop those relationships, call them contracts if you like, um, then they work well. To the extent that they come in and interfere with those contracts and uh, um, impose a top-down solution uh, on the way people do things, I don't think they do work as well. And I feel it's very important to understand the world as, as a bottom-up place, a place where solutions emerge rather than are imposed from, from, from above. There is no doubt that most people don't think in terms of positive sum interactions. We're, we're obsessed with the idea of who's won and who's lost in an interaction. And often both people win. And it's not true that someone's won and someone's lost. And that leads to this uh, thinking that, that things are zero sum. It leads to mercantilism, that e exports are good and imports are bad. It leads to Marxism, that um, bosses are profiting and workers are suffering, or vice versa. Um, uh, and, and the world just isn't like that. Writing a book about how humanity got to where it is today has made me even more optimistic than I was before. The average person on the world is three times as, 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 as well off as he was 50 years ago, despite there being three times as many people. Um, uh, we've, got, we've cut infant mortality by 70% in that period, on average, throughout the world. We've, in, we've increased lifespan, on average, throughout the world, by 30%. Um, these are incredible achievements, recessions, depressions, they're blips in the graph. They're horrible blips when they happen and they're deeply uncomfortable for, for many individuals. But the long run trend is that exchange and specialization are going to increase and spread throughout the world and at the same time we're going to get nicer because all the evidence suggests that the more in, the integrated we are into markets and into commerce, the nicer we are, not the nastier we are. So I think uh, in in a hundred years time everybody's going to be better off, happier and nicer. I'm a huge optimist about the future.